Well, good morning, uh, Facebook family. This is a rather early um, uh, hour of testimony we're going to give you, but that's because we're here with uh, Bishop Jeff Arnold. He allowed us to come here. He, he's been waiting since 9 o'clock, praying, you know, getting getting ready for this. Uh, and he's been really kind and nice to us. We really appreciate the hospitality. <laughs> he even let us in the building, so that was nice. <laughs> because after the drive, you know, we, uh, we needed a place to go to, to you know, after driving for a refresh. couple hours, you have to refresh yourself a little bit. Uh, but I, I'd like to thank my family for last week uh, when we got, or it was a couple weeks ago, we got together. Man, what a great testimony. Um, you know, we did not, um, we didn't get together and, and plan it out. It was just spontaneous. And they, uh, and they gave that testimony in such a way that I, I think it is probably the biggest watched uh, testimony we've given yet uh, this year. Uh, also, I'd like to uh, thank uh, a bishop for allowing us to come to his office. Um, <laughs> as he talks on, on his phone, uh, I am going to ask uh, that you would share this, and if you could, uh, please uh, start a, a watch party. I think this is something you're going to want to share. Get it on your site. This way, others can watch it. Um, also, um, we put. Uh, we will be putting this on YouTube. Uh, the page is Dave, D-A-V-E, Torres, T-O-R-R-E-S, Jr. If you go there and you subscribe, you're going to be able to watch all our testimonies. Uh, they're all on there except for this one. But as soon as we get home, we'll be putting that uh, alongside with all the others. Um, we also had posted Frank T uh, Tamil, Bishop uh, Frank Tamil's uh, one of his messages, one of his sermons, and I think uh, you'd love to see that. Also, Angeline Tamil, his wife, she had one on uh, on the gifts of the Spirit. I, I, I think we posted it, or we will be posting it when we get back. Also, a reminder that our Revelation Bible study will start up again at the end of September, uh, and so I'm excited to get back home and get that started. Also, I want to... Um, uh, inform you uh, about Andrew. Andrew has a podcast, and it's called The One Dollar Apologist. And I'm going to recommend that you go there. Go there, subscribe to uh -huh. it. I think he's got a lot of messages, and he's got some of, uh, of the Tamil family's uh, old preachings that yeah. I think you would really appreciate. My next testimony is hopefully we're getting that lined up. Uh, within the next couple of weeks, uh, we'll be sharing that with you. Uh, oh, also... Uh, I think it's a uh, in your prayers, continue to pray for the churches. And I really would like for us to start praying for the pastors, the assistant pastors, their families. Uh, in Milwaukee, we have several pastors that have really gone through some hard uh, sicknesses and things like that. Uh, and if you could also uh, give a prayer for Dave Myers. Uh, he's been experiencing some, some hardship, uh, some physical uh, things that are going on with him. Uh, and I, I, I would just love for you to offer offer him up before God uh, in prayer. And with that, we are going to let uh, Jeff Arnold uh, share his testimony. You're live. Well, here I am. Uh, I just turned 76 years old. I know I look like I'm 40, but I'm 76. They asked me for my testimony. I was born and raised in Brooklyn, Queens, New York. Uh, my father was a fireman. We moved to South Florida. Went to high school. Went to went to the Air Force for four years. Last year during Vietnam, came out of the Air Force. I'd married my wife. Uh, I was a kind of a heavy drinker, and she never drank at all. And I was a hunky tonker, and she never did like any of that. And after about one year of being married, we decided we was going to get divorced. And uh, so during the night. Uh, the Lord woke me up, and I didn't know the Bible. I, we didn't go to church. We never talked about anything. But the Lord just woke me up during the night, and I, I thought my wife had said something to me. I looked at her. She was asleep. I checked the windows and the doors. I thought maybe I heard something. Uh, I remember going, um, open a can of beer, lit up a cigarette, was sitting there thinking, what's going on? Went back to bed. Next night, same time. Something shook me, something woke me up, scared me half to death, I had goosebumps all over the place. I looked at my wife, she was sound asleep. I walked all over the house, I couldn't figure it out. Well, 
The third night, same time, something shook me. It woke me up. I got up, walked all around the house. I was scared. Uh, you understand, I'm a hunky talker. I'm a hell raiser. I'm a partier. I just came out of four years in the Air Force. I'm not a nice person. And uh, this voice speaks in my brain. I can hear it like it's coming down a hallway. You're almost out of time. It's time to get ready with God. It scared me so bad. I ran into the house. I shook my wife. And I said, Patty, if <laughs> that's funny now. I said, if God would have called me to be a missionary to China, would you go with me? And she looks up at me and she goes, missionary? China? Jeffrey, stop drinking. Go back to bed. So I said, I'm as sober as a judge on Sunday. And I said, I think, I think God's talking to me. And she looked at me and she said, who's talking to you? I said, God's talking to me. We need to go to church. Well, so we tried. Well, I used to work with a Baptist guy at my job, and he was always witnessing to everybody, giving out tracts. Of course, he was a thief. He stole from the warehouse and stole everything. Everybody knew he was a bunch of garbage. But anyway, we went to Northwest Baptist Church. That was where Anita Bryant, the orange juice lady, used to go to. And we went to this big Baptist church way in Miami. Well, it was huge. We, I mean, we had to sit so far back, you almost had to take a bus to get to the altar. I mean, it was huge. And so they did their, what I call their standard Billy Graham thing, uh, accept the Lord as your personal Savior. You must understand something. Even though I was a crook and a criminal, all the years when I was a boy, I believed in God. And I, I got saved in roller rinks. I got saved in high school places. I, I accepted Jesus so many times. I had a deck of cards. I had signed so many cards, you know. But it didn't stop me from being a thief and a liar and a cheat and a whoremonger. But I had all these cards. Well, when they started giving this thing about just this guy was dying and just before he died, accepted the Lord, and he went to glory. And I was sitting there with my head bowed, and I said, Man, this guy's full of crap. He's full of crap. I've heard this for the last 20 years. I don't believe none of this. Well, all of a sudden, I look up, and Sister Arnold's standing there, grabbed my hand, crying. And I said, what happened to you? She said, let's go down to the altar. Well, I look at the altar. You need binoculars. You know, the altar? Down there? So we went down in front of all these people. Well, there were thousands of people in that building. Well, these people all lined up in front of the preacher, and Patty went and nailed down here at this little altar step, and I knelt down here. And we're the only two people in the whole building that kneel down. The only two. Everybody else, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Spa Harbor accepted the Lord as personal Savior. Amen. Uh, Mr. Jones just transferred from Kenosha, and he's in love with God. Praise God. Well, we're up here praying our eyes out. Nobody's paying attention to us, but it's like a, it's like a carnival because all these people are looking like, what are those stupid idiots doing? Why, why would you pray? Well, I'm just praying, and this guy comes up to me, and he says, uh, you know, if you just sign this card and accept the Lord as your personal Savior, you'll be saved. I've done this 15 times. I could have a stamp. I don't even need a signature. I could stamp it. So I signed the card. He goes, well, thank God you're saved. Well, they go over to Sister Arnold. She's over there crying, oh, praying. Now, you got to get this. There's 10 or 12 people lined up. And we're the two behind them. And here's the preacher accepting everybody into the membership and all that, shaking their hands. So they go over to Sister Arnold, and she's crying. Said, ma'am, if you just sign this card, you'll, you'll be saved. And my wife says in this big Baptist church, <laughs> it's funny, saved? Well, I haven't even got the Holy Ghost yet. I haven't even started talking in tongues. What do you mean, saved? And that guy said, Holy Ghost, tongues, whoa. And he leaves her and goes and gets two or three of the big guns. And they come down, and they're having this free-for-all down there with my wife. And everybody in the church is watching. What no? She must have a demon. What's going on? So finally, now, accept me. You ask me to talk, I'm going to talk. Yeah. I've been thrown out of whorehouses. I've been thrown out of honky-tonks. I've been thrown out of hotels. I was thrown out of a bus station once. This is the first time in my life I was ever thrown out of a church. And it was the best thing God ever did for me besides saving me. Because while they're doing all this stuff with Sister Arnold, trying to tell her this stuff, I'm over there. I'm already saved. I don't know what her problem is. And they turn around. The pastor said, 
turns around and says, will you escort this couple out of my sanctuary? They are disturbing my service. Doc, I was so embarrassed. My face was red as a tomato. And I, I've told people for years, I said, if my wife had not been with me, I would have jumped through a plate glass window and went to a local bar and just got bombed. Fine. But I had my wife. Well, I went out. I was, y'all, let's pray that they'll accept the Lord as their Savior. And I walked out of the building. They took us in a back room. And they started talking to us and telling us, quoting scriptures, Romans 3.23, Romans 6.23, all this, you know, blah, blah, blah. And my wife, you have to understand, at that time, my wife was the total introvert. I mean, she was shy, introverted. I was boisterous. I was ballistic. Didn't bother me. Well, we're total opposites. Well, we're sitting there, and they're giving us all this junk. I'd heard all this junk before. I've been saved at all these churches. And and all of a sudden, my wife never says a thing about it. She says, Jeffrey, these guys are lying to you. I said, Patty, we're in a church. We're in the back of a church. You don't want to call these people a bunch of liars. These are all, they're a bunch of liars is what they are. They're stinking liars. I'm shocked with her. She said, they're not telling you the truth. And they're trying to calm her down. And she's mad. I mean, and she's redhead. So she's got red hair and a red face. She's mad. And she says, listen to me. When I was a little girl, my mother died. And I went into an orphanage, and they adopted me out of an orphanage. My aunt adopted me out of the orphanage, and she took me to Brother Fred Kinsey's Apostolic Church in Toledo. And when I was a little girl, I repented, and I was baptized in Jesus' name. And I never received the Holy Ghost, but I saw people that get the Holy Ghost. And when you're born again, you're baptized in Jesus' name, and you receive the Holy Ghost talking in tongues. Well, they kind of laughed at her. I'm sitting there like going... I need a drink. Is what I need. I need to get out of here. I need a drink. And I got this war zone going on in the back of a church. And he goes, well, uh, Mrs. Arnold, they, they did that in the, at Pentecost when the church first started. But people don't do that anymore. Now you just accept the Lord. And she turns around and she says, you're lying. That's not the truth. You're lying. So, so she says, get me out of here. Well, I'm, I'm ready to get out of there. And I apologize to these guys and said, I'm sorry. You know, she's my wife, you know, she, so we go out and we're standing in the hot sun and, and uh, we're talking. She's crying. She's so mad. She said, Jeffrey, you want to go to this church? That's your business. I ain't never going to this dumb church. I said, what's the problem? He says, first, these idiots believe in three gods. I said, what? He said, they believe in three gods. He said, there ain't but one God. Even the Indians only believe in one God. And, and, and I said, well, I never heard of that. I said, you take me to an apostolic Pentecostal Jesus name church. I never heard of that. I've been the Baptist, Presbyterian, Catholic, Episcopalian. I'm, I said, well, who's a what's that kind of church? She said, you take me to a church that baptizes in Jesus name, believes in the Holy Ghost, talking in tongues. I had no idea what she was talking about. So we left. We looked in the yellow pages. There's no apostolic church, but there's a United Pentecostal church. And my wife says, I think... I think United Pentecostal is the same as Apostolic. So we go to the church. It's a little church, 60, 70 people by a railroad track with a lady pastor and all these people banging on tambourines and carrying on. And I'm sitting there going, man, these suckers are rejects from Barnum and Bailey Circus. Man, this, these people are nuts. I'm just sitting there and going, you got to be kidding me. Well, we, we went like three weeks in a row and then we, we stopped. Okay. Well, the Sister Swinford, who was the pastor, sent a little note. I still have a little card with puppy dogs. And it said, counted noses last Sunday. Guess who came up missing? And it so touched me that I said, you know, those are nice people. They're a little weird, but it's nice people. I said, uh, let's go back. Well, so we go back. I'm sitting in the service. Now, I'm not lying. I'm sitting in the service. They're doing their thing. They're banging on the tambourines. They can't sing in tune. The piano's out of tune. You know, they just, and that lady jumps off the platform. She's got a bottle of slapping people in the head. And, and the piano, blah, blah, blah. I have no idea what they're doing. I'm thinking, these people need therapy. They need help. Well, while I'm standing there, all of a sudden, sitting there, I mean, all of a sudden, it's like this warm wind just comes down over my face. And comes all the way down, clear into my feet and back up again. And I'm, it's like hot inside of me. Yes. And I'm going, whew. And I'm freaked out. 
and I turn to Sister Arla and I say to her, Patty, and I'm doing this, I'm going, what is this? She said, what is what? I used to work for the power company. We built substations, okay? And when you went into a substation, the transformers and the regulators put out an energy charge. And if you got close to them, it would make your hair on your arm stand up. You had to wear gloves or you had to wear a hard hat. It was just, it, uh, well, I'm trying to think what it is. It's an energy, char energy charge. It comes from the transformer or the regulator. Well, that's what happened to me. My hair was standing up. My hair was standing I'm going, I said, don't you feel this? And she says, feel what? I said, this. I mean, it was like an uh, a invisible envelope or something that, that I'm inside this, whatever it is. And so she says, you're feeling the Holy Ghost. And I said, well, what is the Holy Ghost? She said, it's the spirit of Jesus that comes to live inside people. And I said, well, I don't understand what's going on. But this is the church we're going to go to from now on. And she looked at me. She told me later she thought I was going to run out of the building because of all the wacko stuff that was going on. And she says, why are we going to stay here? And that's what I told her. I said, because this is the same stuff that woke me up those three nights in the house. And so God introduced me to Pentecost with a supernatural experience. So nobody had to debate me and nobody had to teach me a 46-week Bible study. I just knew it was real. Well, then we came into the church and we became probably two of the best slaves they had. Mm -hmm. I drove the bus. I cut the lawn. My wife cleaned church. I took the kids back and forth from youth service. And it was a small church and it was only like one other young couple in the whole church. Everybody else was retired people from up north. Everybody's on Geritol. You know, we had no fellowship. They didn't have to build me a $4 million gymnasium to keep me in the church. I, you know, I, and so I just got into church. Uh, my dad uh, got really upset with me. Uh, we didn't talk. My mother had already died. And my father told people that he, and told my other brother, he said, you know, your brother Jeffrey is... Uh, He's got into a cult. He's in a cult like Jimmy Jones, the Kool-Aid and Guyana. He's in some kind of cult because they knew I was such a crook. I was a criminal. I robbed places. I stole tires. I, I got arrested. I've been in jail. I was a bad boy. And all of a sudden, in one night, so I walked out of the church after we first started coming. And we walked out, and I went in the car, and I lit up a cigarette. And I'm sitting and I said, you know, Patty, there's something funny about this church. It's the only church I've ever been to that the preacher and the people don't walk out and light up a cigarette butt and start talking. They all do it. The Catholic priests do it. The Baptists, they all do it. And, and my wife says, oh, well, they preach against smoking. And I'm taking a big, big drag on my cigarette. I'm going, <laughs> I said, they preach against smoking? What's the matter with smoking? And I looked at her and she said, well, they feel like smoking and tobacco is a dirty habit, causes emphysema, causes cancer, makes your clothes stink. It doesn't help you any at all. Now, I have the cigarette in my hand. I have a cigarette in my hand. And I'm going, you know, that makes sense. You're probably right. And I put the cigarette out. Never smoked again. It's been 45 years, okay? So I'm going home and I go to... I always drank liquor, I always drank rum and Cokes, I always drank beer, and talked to my wife, and she said, you know, they, they, they asked their people not to, not to drink alcohol. And I went, what? What's the matter with alcohol? She says, well, then you get crazy, you do things you shouldn't do, you'd be better off not doing it. Now, this is funny. I got a half pack of, uh, a half quarts, six pack, of old Milwaukee beer, and I only got four of the six, okay? I walk, <laughs> I walk across the street, and I go to the 7-Eleven, and I bring the carton of cigarettes back to him, and I bring the beer back to him. And I said, could I get my money back for this? And he goes, well, what's the matter? Is there something wrong with it? I said, no, the beer tastes great, and I really enjoy smoking the cigarettes. He says, well, why are you bringing it back? I said, well, now you understand, I've only been going to church like five weeks. I don't know nothing. 
I said, well, my wife and I started going to a church and, and they asked their people not to smoke cigarettes and to drink liquor. And this guy across the counter says to me, he goes, whoa, man, you started going to one of them old time religion churches. <laughs> and so then the rest is history. We both got baptized in Jesus' name. We both got the Holy Ghost and we lived in that church and uh, worked ourselves silly until the Lord put his hand on me to give me a call to get out into the ministry. I was the youth pastor. I was the youth pastor, the lawn maintenance guy. I was the mechanic. I was the painter guy. I was, you know, I was jack of all trades, man. I was the best slave they ever had, man. They didn't pay me a dime. You know, I, I like to ask some people sometimes, whatever happened to God's volunteer army? We got a generation now that you got to pay them to do everything they're going to do. But when I got saved, man, I was just happy to do anything I could, you know. So my, we just stayed there. And then after that, I started to go evangelizing. And my wife and I traveled everywhere. And I, I, I learned how to do my magic tricks and my puppet shows because I was a youth pastor. And we were fighting against the kids doing Friday night football and all this stuff, how to keep the kids interested. So I started doing magic tricks and I learned how to do magic tricks. And I had a ventriloquist doll and I had a puppet. And my wife and I did puppet shows. And in fact, when I first went out evangelizing for years, nobody ever asked me to preach. Nobody. Because I was a children's evangelist. So I always did kids' crusades and I did children's ministry. And I blew, I was the first guy in Pentecost that used to blow those balloons up. I taught people how to blow those balloons and I'd make little twisty animals and I'd give them to kids when I talked to them and visited them. And so then we just, you know, we evangelized for eight years and, uh, and I had preached three revivals for this church years ago two for Alan Oggs, one for Jim McElhaney. And then when we were preaching our last revival, the church, Brother McElhaney, was leaving to go evangelize, and the church asked my wife and I to take this church. Well, I, I said, I can't take this church. I just started evangelizing. I don't know. That's, that's not the will of God for me. So then we evangelized for eight years, and then the church came again and asked me if I would take this church. Well, this was the... Oh, I shouldn't say this. This was the only church in Pentecost I never wanted to pastor. I preached everywhere. And this was the most non-Pentecostal church I'd ever seen in my life. I mean, they had immorality, and they had worldliness, and they had ungodliness, and they, they had a preacher-hater spirit. The building was broke down, and, and, the, and the roof was leaking, and oh, God. And they developed a hatred towards preachers because preachers were no good. They just ripped everybody off. So I had to live that down for probably the first five years that I pastored here. They didn't trust me, you know, you're just a cheat and a liar. But it turned around, and the Lord turned around, and we ended up, by God's mercy, to build a pretty good church here in Gainesville, you know. And so that's how we started, uh, and I guess that's my testimony, you know. The only thing I'd say is that even as a boy in New York City, I think God did something in my heart. I had two brothers. None of them cared about church. My mom and dad never went to church. My mother was an ex-Catholic. She got excommunicated from the church because she married my dad, who was a Protestant. So, and, you know, they didn't go to church except Easter. That was it. And so I was the only guy in my whole family. But when I was a kid, I loved, they used to show I think it was 16 millimeter or 35 millimeter films at the church I went to, black and whites about Jesus. And I used to love to watch the pictures. And then when I was growing up, I went to the movies and I saw Charlton Heston and the Ten Commandments and the Rome and the gladiators. I loved all that. I always had a tenderness and a something in me that I wanted to be a Christian, but I didn't know how to be. There was no Bible in my home. There was no teaching. There was nothing. In fact, as I sit here now talking to you folks and you folks, I'm the most unlikely guy to be in Pentecost. I got no heritage. I had nobody in my family, no aunts and uncles to encourage me. Both of our grandparents were dead. There was nobody in our, in our families that were even near Pentecost. They were all Roman Catholics. And it was like, for how God just reached down, as Peter said, and snatched me out and brought me out of darkness into his marvelous light is a miracle in itself. Mm -hmm. And so I've, you know, I, 
I've just maintained preaching and teaching and and doing the best I can. Now, is there anything else I need to say? Yeah, I did have a, a, I did okay, have a, a Flash over here has got these secret <laughs> questions. So don't look at me. Look at Flash. Yeah, he's going to, he's the, he's the music. He's Cecil B. DeMille of Pentecost. Go ahead. Uh, one of my questions, well, I did say I was only going to ask one, uh, but I have another one. Go ahead. But, but, but one of them is this. Uh, when we're going online, we have a lot of pastors and evangelist uh, talking about the times that we're living in right now. Yeah. Uh, because for years we've talked about that this time would come. And right now you have like uh, Lee Stone King, Brother Cisco, Art Wilson, uh, and they're saying that we're living in a time where these mysteries are really being revealed in a time yeah. where right. God is opening uh Everything that we've been taught is becoming a reality. Like he told Daniel, is the, the book is sealed till yes. the end time. Right. What, what is your uh, biblical response to what's going well, on right now? Well, I don't know what's a biblical response. First, I think that we're really at the, the edge of the coming of the Lord. You know, God wanted to bring Israel out of bondage, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. He couldn't get them out until he turned up the heat. As long as they lived in Goshen... And they had the favor of Joseph as the kingpin. It's fine. But when a new Pharaoh came up that knew not Joseph, they turned the heat on the Jews. Up to that time, you can't find anywhere in the scripture where the Jews ever asked, get us out of here. Take us to the promised land. They didn't want to leave. Everything was fine. But all of a sudden, when they started murdering their children, and they started making them slaves, and they put taskmasters over them, then the Bible says the lamentable cry of the children of Israel came up before the Lord. So I think where we are right now is divinely designed to get us to get divorced from how comfortable we are in this world. Nothing wrong with having enough money to pay your bills and, and enjoy certain things, but it's almost like we've meshed into, you can't hardly tell the, the Christian from the non-Christian. From the, from the believer, from the pagan. So I'm thinking that there's been such a disruption here. Secondly, let me, let me tell you this, and I've been praying for a long time, and I've been preaching this, although nobody believes it. I am firmly convinced that all this mob violence and all these moronic fools in Seattle and Portland and, and Wisconsin and Chicago and New York and Rochester, they are too stupid to do the things that they're doing. Those people are way too stupid. They're not, they're too stupid. They are being motivated and inspired by devils, mm -hmm. by demons, mm -hmm. by vile and evil spirits. Paul said we wrestle against, not against flesh and blood, principalities, powers, spiritual wickedness, high places. I am convinced that these spirits have been released on this generation to agitate these stupid people. And cause them to burn down buildings and shoot police and, and shoot little children and, and, and loot and destroy and kill. Until the point that the people are so upset with this that they're calling for change. When they started this Black Lives Matter thing, I had no problem with that. I thought, you know, that's good. If, if they're being injustice and the police are not doing right, we need to make some change. But I think since then that movement has been hijacked by domestic terrorism, and they're hiding behind that, and they're using that to justify all their wickedness and evil. So I really think that this thing has is, to me, a, a catalyst from the Lord to say, time to pray, stupid. Time to stop playing church, stupid. It's time to get real, stupid. And it's kind of like, what are you going to do? When I, when I spoke to that Jamaican church last week, I made a statement to him. I said, look, I'm naturally... A ballistic man. I'm naturally, let's get ready to rumble. You know, you punch me in the face, I'm going to cut your head off, and I'll pray for your salvation later. But it was like, oh, me, uh, you threaten me, threaten my wife, try to hurt my children. I'm going to hurt you. I'm going to hurt you really bad. And so, uh, and I said, so I've had to pray every day that the peace of God that passes understanding will restrain me will help me. Point in case, a few weeks ago I went to a gas station and I was getting gas and I went into the building to pay it. A police officer came out. He had a little mask on and I walked up to him and I said, sir, I need to ask you something. He backed away from me like I was going to attack him. 
I said, you're safe. I said, I'm a God-fearing man. I'm a taxpayer. I try to be a law-abiding citizen. I don't molest children. I don't rape women. I don't rob places. I'm a nice guy. But you people on the news have now said, we can't call 911 because your response time is six days. 911. I said, I paid tens of thousands of dollars in tax, but I can't get you suckers to help me. I said, I'm asking you an honest question. What do we law-abiding citizens do if we can't get the police to help us and protect us? This officer looked at me and said, pay the $120, go to City Hall, and buy yourself a concealed weapon permit and carry a gun. And I looked at him and I said, I don't want to carry a gun. Some sucker beats my window in or tries to attack my wife. I'll put a hole in that sucker as big as a bowling ball. What? I don't want to shoot nobody. He said, well, the people that are attacking you, they're angry. They're filled with villainy and wickedness. They don't care about anything. They're doing this with impunity because the people that we work for, the mayors and the councilmen, are standing with the terrorists. They're not standing with the police. They're not standing with you. Okay, buy yourself a gun, keep it in your glove compartment or someplace, and if they ever attack you, just blow their brains out because you have a right to carry that gun. Well, I thought, geez, I, uh, I need advice like that like I need polio. <laughs> Give me a break for crying out loud. But that's where we are. And so people are really apprehensive. I mean, the people can't even take their kids out to the park to go anywhere. The other day on the news, they couples riding with a one-year-old baby in the baby seat, the sucker comes up and shoots through the window, shoots and kills the one-year-old baby. Yes. Black Lives Matter. What does that got to do with Black Lives Matter? But the people are angry, but they're being manipulated. I am convinced. So even this morning when I prayed, Lord, dispatch angels, do battle. At the same time, shake us loose. Because this would be a great time for us to really step into spirituality and see a great revival and an influx and a harvest of people. But it's kind of like, man, who would have ever thought? I'm 76. I know I look 35. I'm 76. Who would have ever thought I'd ever see America like this? Yeah. That you would spit in cops. That you would, you would attack police. That you would shoot police. Like, everywhere you're looking, it don't make no sense. People are afraid. People are apprehensive. That's why I think if we could wake up and have more spiritual church and less administrative church. I believe in Jesus. Oh, I get so sick of that. I believe in Jesus. No, we need a move of the Holy Ghost. That's why I did that message. We need a miracle working God. We need the supernatural to step in. You know, when you and I were coming out of darkness into light, it was the supernatural that brought us. Yeah. And I told the guy the other day, he said, you don't believe in the supernatural? I said, let me ask you something stupid. Do you ever pray? Oh, sure. I said, are you stupid or what? To get an answer, that's supernatural. You're natural, he's spiritual. Hello? Why would you pray if you don't believe the supernatural works? And I said, there's nothing any greater in this planet that's supernatural than the baptism of the Holy Ghost. That's as supernatural as you can get. Your flesh He's divine. He moves in your house. You got his DNA. You're pregnant with the power of God. That's the supernatural. But for some reason, this, this thing that's happening today, I, I'm concerned. You asked me the question? Okay. The Pentecostal people are hunkering down. They're hunkering down. I'm not against you guys wearing masks. I wear a mask when I have to. Fine, that's, that's caution. Just like I lock my door. It's not because I don't trust God. I just don't trust my neighbor. So I lock the door. Fine. But I turned around and I said, I have never seen such fear grip a hold of crazy Pentecostal people. They won't come to church. They'll go to the mall. They'll go shopping. But they won't come to church. Oh, no, that's dangerous. And they just, and they hunker behind their little doors. And I'm going... God's not giving us a spirit of fear, love, power, and a sound mind. I said, there's nothing wrong with being cautious, but I think there's something wrong with being stupid. I said, I have talked to more Pentecostal people, and in my perception, they feel God has been thrown off his throne, and hell took his scepter, and he ain't charging nothing. But I got news for you, baby cakes. The book says in Daniel 
That angel talked with Nebuchadnezzar when he threw him off his throne and he went ballistic crazy. He said, till thou knowest that the heavens do rule in the kingdoms of men. So even though all this hell and chaos and junk is going on, the heavens rule. Yeah. Now, now, because God rules does not mean he doesn't allow stupid people to do stupid things. But he's still in charge. Yeah. He could sneeze in our direction and fix everything. Yeah. He could snap his finger and fix everything. So I have been praying and praying, God, what are you trying to tell us? What are you showing us? I know you could go like that and the coronavirus would be gone. It'd be gone. Yes. But why this is going on, whether you're trying to get our attention, whether... We are being paid back for all our abortions, for all our same-sex marriage junk, all our perversions, all the stupid stuff that different presidents have put. I don't know. I'm not, I don't know. All I know is God is involved with this. And there's some reason. Remember, nothing can happen to a child of God that doesn't first cross God's desk and he either says yes or no. Because he's in charge. He's the highest potentate of all. And so I'm looking at all the stuff that's going on, and I'm also looking at the great division that's going on in our nation. Well, if you will take five minutes to study world history, you'll find out not one nation across the planet has ever functioned properly and successfully under the regime of socialism. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. You got to decipher this and say, wait a minute. There's so much lying and so much dishonesty going on. You ask me, let me answer my question, your question. And the Lord shall be the hope of his people. Amen. There you go. That's it. The Lord shall be the hope of his people. I personally think that a lot of the prophetic promises that have been locked up in secret God somehow is bringing that to the front yeah. now. Because, you know, I said, Israel couldn't leave bondage until they didn't like it anymore. As long as they enjoyed Goshen, it was fine. Mm -hmm. But God wanted them out of there to go to another level. In order to do that, he had to let them people get beat half to death, make slaves, taskmasters, murder their children, threw them in the rivers and all that stuff. Then Israel said, Help! I haven't seen, even in the apostolic Pentecostal movement in the last 20 years, help! It's rather, uh, would you stay away? I've got things to do. I want to marry. I want to have a family. I want to go to college. I want to, you know, praise Jesus. I just, I really think that part of this, maybe even a bigger part of this chaos and crisis, God is revealing to us there's a church within the church. Yeah. Everybody that goes to church ain't the church. They're just playing games. Yeah. And okay, so here's what's scary right now. These people that are not real with God and don't really live in the Holy Ghost, they're going to be swept away by this. They're going to marry themselves to the government. That's how the Antichrist is going to have the mark of the beast. That's how it's going to work. But yeah. so, you know, it's like, and, and a deceiver spirit's gone out there. Let me, let me say something to you before I leave. All over Pentecost, I have, I have said this, and you need to hear this. You need to pray every day against the spirit and emotion of deception. Now listen why. If a man is immoral or a lady is immoral, they do not need a preacher to put them under conviction. They already know they're immoral. If a person is a thief or a liar or a drug addict, or a dishonest person. They don't need church and they don't need a preacher. They know that. But when a person is deceived, they don't know they're deceived because the deception of deception is deception. So they don't know they're deceived. And what I've been praying for is that myself, my family, our church, people that we would not be seduced by the spirits that are working, nor be deceived by what's going down. You just, what's right is right. Yes. What is godly is godly. What is holy is holy. None of that changes just because of nincompoops burning down buildings and shooting innocent people. Yes. That, they're just stupid. They're being inspired and motivated and impacted by evil spirits. Because the Bible talks about that. And so 
I've been praying every day that God would allow an activation of the Holy Ghost in a greater measure among us, that he would send angels to do battle for us, to bind these spirits. Because if he'll bind these spirits, those people won't act like that. See, they're too stupid to do that stuff. They're stupid, normal stupid. Now when they got these demons, now they're extra stupid. And they think they're doing a, they're filled with hate and animosity. Where's that coming from? Well, hate is the offspring of Satan. He hates God. He hates God's people. He hates morality. He hates honesty. He hates peace. So he's moving and working in these people. The sad part is the, the, the mayors and the governors of these cities and states are sitting there going, oh, I'm so glad they're murdering and they're killing and they're burning. Yesterday, the news said the unrest from Seattle and Portland has now totaled $6 billion. $6 billion. You ready? And none of the jerky protesters are going to pay a dime. They're not going to pay a dime. In New Jersey yesterday, the commission came up and said because so many multi-millionaires have moved out of Jersey because of the crime. We are now going to increase the taxes on all the people that stay here to pay for the loss of revenue. But see, God is allowing to turn up the heat so that people might turn around and say, I need God. We need help. So I hope I answered your question. Uh-oh, here we go. We got, we, got, we got another one, folks. We have a lot of young people out there and they feel, how, how am I going to say this? They, they want to do something for God. Yeah. Uh, they know something supernatural is happening all around right. them. What kind of a word of advice can you give to them? Because some of them are <clears throat> doing podcasts. Some are doing what I'm doing. Some, uh, uh, they think that they need to hear a trumpet and they okay. can go out. Real, I'll what, answer that real easy. What advice easier. do you have for them? God is the easiest and most wonderful being in the universe to deal with. That's why children ran up to Jesus. Jesus was God manifest in the flesh. He was the fullness of the Godhead body. Only hypocrites and plastic people and church fakers didn't like him. But children loved him. And sinners who knew that their lives were all lousy, they gravitated to him. Why? Because he kept saying, there's a possibility of change. There's a possibility of renewal. Well, I try to tell people all the time, look, it's real easy to do something for God. First, all God ever asks you to do is be honest. Be naked and transparent about your emotions, about your feelings, about your mistakes, about your failures, about your thought life. And when you mess up and drop the ball, go to God and say, I messed up. I'm sorry, because you ain't going to do nothing that he didn't already know. He knows all that. But you don't need a lightning bolt to do something for God. Work where you are. Yes. Find something that you can do. You don't have to preach a conference or a sermon or, or something. All you got to, if, if God wants you to do something, which I think he does, make it up in your mind. You're going to try to walk with him, try to read his word and learn it. Okay, You don't have to be a loony. Just walk with God. And ask God to direct you, open doors, have somebody to talk to. You know, it's funny. You just ask this, do something for God. Do you realize that the Lord wanted that guy in that dream in Acts 16? Paul says he has a vision and a dream. And he sees a man from Macedonia saying, come over and help us. Okay, and then it says, Paul immediately perceived that the Lord had called him to Macedonia, duh, boy, ain't that brilliant, duh, fine, so guess what, he goes all the way over to Macedonia, he never finds the man, you see, he finds women washing their clothes at the river, and he has a Bible study with them, but God wants that man saved, but he's, He's not being testified to by anybody in Pentecost. We're too busy telling each other how great we are. So what does God do? He says, I got to get somebody on site. I know what I'll do. I'll let them beat Paul and Silas's brains out. And they'll drag him through the street. And they'll beat him half to death. And they'll throw him in the jail. And guess what? The man in a dream was the Philippian jailer. And then when that earthquake happened, that, that filled me in jail. What must I do to be saved? It was like Paul said, 
Ah, oh, you're the guy I dreamed about. So all God wants to do is get somebody on site. But it doesn't have to always be some dynamic earthquake. Just live your light in front of somebody. Share your... Let me say this. Don't get frustrated when you share your light and your truth with people and they tell you to drop dead or they're not interested. Remember, the greatest man that ever lived was Jesus of Nazareth and he didn't win everybody. He didn't win everybody. The rich lung ruler just walked away and said, I'm not interested. Crowds in John 6, when he turned around and said, except you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life in him. The multitudes left him in the dust. What a day that must have been for Jesus. In the middle of his ministry, that 90% of his crowd walked away and said, we don't want that junk. And instead of Jesus getting discouraged and going, well, I guess I was wrong. Let me go suck my Pentecostal thumb. He just turned around and said, hey, you guys, uh, you're going to go away also? Let me know because I'm going to get me another crew. So, you know, God's got a replacement standard. So even if you don't want the things of God, don't worry about it. God ain't going to backslide and fall off the throne and have a headache. Hey, you don't want to live for God? Fine. Let me tell you something. In our generation, we hear so much about human choice. And God will not violate human will and human choice. Well, we'll see about that. Anyway, here's what it is. People that go to hell forever, God has just honored their choice. You didn't want me. You thought I was a fool and stupid. It wasn't worth your time and your money. You chose to go to hell. I'm going to honor your choice. Goodbye. And they go. And it's kind of like, whoa. So it's like, okay. When I was young, coming into church, I never thought about being a preacher. I never thought about being Jeff Arnold, whatever that means. I cut the lawn. I worked on sprinklers. I painted I built things in the church. I found whatever my hands to do, I found to do it, to try and help. That's all. I never reached for the pulpit. I never tried to be a youth leader. I never tried to be a big dog, a big kahuna, some kind. Of, I never tried that. I just, I never thought I was going to be a preacher. I just was just glad to just work and do what I could. It became my life. I'm 76. As God is my witness. Church has never stopped being my life. Not, not UPC, not Methodist or Baptist or Episcopalian or Church of Christ. No, no, that's just labels and stationary. Church, the body of Christ. That's my life. And, I, and all I, if you ask me that question, I hope I'm answering. Here it is. Ask God to show you how you can please God. I've never heard anybody but myself ever preach a sermon on, is God pleased with you or are you a pain in the neck? Does God got to blow your nose all the time and powder your rump to keep you saved? Give me a break. I said, when's the last time you ever asked yourself, am I bringing God any pleasure or do I just bring him pain? Am I making him glad or am I bringing him grief? That's a serious thing to ask. And you know what? All he wants you to do is be honest. Show me what I can do. Let me feel what I can do. I promise you, God is not a liar. He will show you. He will open the door for you. He will make you to sense and feel. And even then, when you do the will of God, sometimes it's scary. Sometimes you don't know whether it's right or wrong. You've got to put your foot out into the water. Remember, the Jordan didn't roll back until they put their foot in the water. Right. So we want the Jordan to roll back, but we want our feet dry. <laughs> it don't work that. It don't work that way. You got to get your feet wet before the miracle takes place. I'm finished. I've done all I could. I'm leaving for Puerto Rico. Goodbye. I love you. Um, thank you for you know. It's it's so early. Thanks for joining us. Uh, and we're going to publish this um, uh, and get it on YouTube as soon as we possibly can. Uh, but I want you to know that uh, I, I don't think that uh, uh, I'm trying to the bishop. We got to put uh, Bishop Jeff Arnold realizes how much he's loved. Uh, and can you do me a favor? I, I've asked you guys to do things, uh, and and sometimes you get a response, sometimes you don't. Can you uh, send a response uh, on how you feel about Jeff Arnold and what he's done in your life? <laughs> 
do that for me. I will try to forward those things. Even if you want to send them a letter, uh, let them know how much no curse he's impacted words. your life, do that. Uh, I think that's so important. Uh, he's given his whole life to this, and I think it's time for us to let him know how much we care for him. That's so uh, he's, been, he's had such a big impact in my life as a young man, uh, in our family's life, uh, that uh, it, we don't have pastors willing or uh, uh, men of God willing to say it like it is. Uh, because they're so afraid right now because of, you know, uh, the, the politics and things like that. But if God is coming, let's say he's coming next week, Wednesday, I don't think we have time to really uh, sit, you know, just sit doing nothing right. uh, and playing politics. I think we have to go forward and we have to start using the gifts of the Spirit that God has given us. So Amen. thank you. We appreciate you. And I'm going to ask Bishop to please close in prayer. Um, uh, and uh, hopefully that God will bless us all through this prayer. Dear Lord, I thank you so much for what these sweet people are doing with this Internet stuff, and I pray the blessings of God that makes rich and adds no sorrow would overtake them as well as all the sweet people watching this. Please let these truths and these testimonies impact people and encourage and strengthen people. Help them not to be intimidated. Help them not to be filled with fear and anxiety and worry. Let the peace of God keep their hearts and minds. Bless them and let them walk with you in the Spirit. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 God bless.